a little bit about myself. I'm an international lawyer by training and background and practice. I practiced law for 21 years um, before turning, before quitting. Oh. Hello. Oh. Can everyone mute their phone who is, uh, has any noise in the background? Thank you. Um, so about uh, 17 years ago, I quit the law and decided that my passion was to do research into um, ways of solving global challenges. I worked for five years. Hello, good morning. Good morning. I worked for five years at the State Department and while I was working in the legal advisor's office, I realized that many of the solutions that we we, our government, our country tries to craft to global challenges or cut and paste solutions, sort of what have we done in the past? How can we jigger it a little bit uh, to tailor it to the current situation? Even though the past solutions did not work and were clearly failures, we try to adapt them to current situations. I also realized that um, we live in a very reactive environment. There, is, there are a lot of crises. There is no time. Nobody seems to have the time to do long-term thinking and come up with proactive solutions that actually go to the root of the problem as opposed to dealing with the current crisis and how do we put out the fire, regardless of the fact that the embers continue to burn and are just waiting for the next wind to blow them into another full conflagration. So. That's why I set up um, the Center for Peace and Global Governance, which is an online forum for uh, pooling and proposing ideas for tackling global challenges in a principled fashion. And this is really the key that I, I want to emphasize here. All my thinking and work is based on the premise that we need to first identify a set of principles um, that all nations can agree on, achieve consensus around them, and then apply them methodically. And this was what my first book uh, written in 2008 was about called Collective Security Within Reach. Um, and I demonstrated how just doing that alone um, uh, would enable us to tackle a whole bunch of global challenges. Fast forward seven years to when I wrote the, the book that we're talking about today, which is Building a World Federation, the key to resolving our global crises. I realized that um, identifying a set of principles in and of itself was not going to be enough, that we needed to have an institutional infrastructure that could embody those principles into which the principles were woven very deliberately that would enable us to actually tackle our global challenges. So let me begin here. Um, I will just share a few um, uh, big ideas, basically, that I think are key and that are the underpinnings of the book. And then we can move into questions and, and obviously your book club discussion, which is what everybody's here for. So the first big idea is that we need to recognize the reality of our unprecedented interconnectedness. Now, it sounds obvious, but people have only started thinking and writing about it really over the last few years. And a number of thinkers have now started talking about it very openly and, and delving into what this means. One of the things it means is that the world as a whole has become a single organism or one body. This in turn means that when one part of the body ails, it simply, um, the rest of the body simply cannot afford to say, hey, you know, we don't care that the liver is diseased. You know, that's its problem. We're going to focus on ourselves. You know, the, the heart can't say, I don't care that the lungs have emphysema. It's none of my business. You know, you go uh, lungs first, heart first. We just go our separate ways. So this idea of interconnectedness um, is a key one. Now, one of the downsides of interconnectedness and one of the realities of it is that it leads to, uh, um, it makes us susceptible to systemic risk and illness. This is the reality that we as human beings and as a global society seem to have chosen to ignore. It is very normal when you're so interconnected that you have become like one body, that you become prone to systemic ailments. These systemic ailments manifest themselves in the global challenges we see. Climate change is a systemic ailment. It affects all of us. 
and can only be solved by the collective whole. Nuclear proliferation and the threat of nuclear holocaust and indeed arms proliferation of all kinds is another um, a, a, a symptom and um, an ailment. Um, the financial crises, the return, or the recurring global financial crises, and I frankly believe that we haven't seen the earthquake yet. I think we've experienced four shocks that we're, we're in, I believe, uh, for quite a rude awakening with a massive um, economic and financial earthquake that is coming our, our, our way if we don't change our habits very quickly, turn on a dime. Okay, so given that we have all of these systemic risks, what are we to do about them? So this leads me to the next thing. We now have a choice to make. We can either self-destruct or deepen our unity and integration, which means moving towards um, a system of global governance that reflects the reality of our interconnectedness, that reflects the reality that humanity as a whole is going through, through the throes of a collective adolescence and standing at the threshold of its maturity. So this is, let me just um, share the second big idea. First was we're one body. The second idea is that if we were to view humanity as a whole, as an individual going through various stages of growth, we now stand, uh, are going through the collective stage of a turbulent adolescence with all the acting out that's involved and all the flirtation with danger and disaster. Um, it is a, it's a wonderful image to have because it, it engenders hope. And uh, I believe one of the biggest risks and dangers facing us today is loss of hope. When we start to look at ourselves, though, as going through turbulent adolescence, we realize, oh, yes, well, the good news is adolescence is a period, it's a phase, and we eventually come out of it into a stage of maturity. And so we don't give up on ourselves, we don't get depressed, we don't get paralyzed. Indeed, we increase our endeavor. Are you, are you, are you hearing it? Are you in or not? Hello? I think that was uh, Tom, it sounded like. Okay. okay. Yeah, Tom, please mute your phone in the other location. <laughs> Too many gadgets. <laughs> yes. I'm going to hang up there, okay? All right. And there's another phone that starts with 314, if they can mute theirs as well. 314 to... Yeah. Let's just ask everyone to mute your phone unless you're speaking. Thank you. That's good. All right. So... What's going to take us from this stage of adolescence to maturity? So one of the things that we need to do, both to meet our capacities and needs as we move collectively towards maturity, and also that in itself will be a hallmark of our maturity, is to build institutions of global governance that match the stage of our development. And that is what this book is about, building a world federation. And I definitely believe that is, it is the key to resolving our global crises. We have tried everything else. This is the only untried, truly viable solution to, to uh, tackling our global challenges. Um, the longer we continue as we are, the longer we're going to suffer physically, mentally, and emotionally. Um, and the longer we're going to retard our progress as this uh, uh, organism that is developing and, and moving towards maturity, we're going to stay in adolescence longer than we need to stay, which we, many of us have experienced in everyday life, the 40-year-old who tries to behave as though they're 18. It, it's not attractive and it doesn't work so well. All right. So what does, in short, this, um, this new institutional infrastructure look like? Well, um, I posit that we need to have a global decision-making institution in the form of a world parliament. And we've had discussions on this forum about the need for a world uh, parliament with Andreas's uh, wonderful book on, on, on a, a, about a world parliament. So in my mind, um, just to be very simple and clear about it, why we need a world parliament is we need an institution that A, represents, is truly representative of all the nations and peoples of the world. So it's a truly representative parliament, um, freely elected by all. 
It is, um, we need it because in this world where we have all these global problems, we need global solutions and therefore we need global laws that are binding on all nations. Um, so we need basically an international legislature that passes binding and compulsory laws. Okay, I, I guess I'm hearing feedback. I'm yeah, hearing ex yeah, excuse me a minute, Saveda. We are getting an echo. Can everyone mute your phone? The echo is likely coming from another phone. So please mute your phone if it's not already muted. Thank you. Um, all right, so a world parliament, binding laws in areas that are of collective concern to us all. So it's key to note here that we're not talking about a world parliament swooping in and taking over all decision making in all spheres of endeavor. It is just in a very limited number of spheres where we have collective problems that can only be solved collectively. Climate change is a really good example of that. So, World Parliament. Um, one of the authorities and powers that a, a, a World Parliament should have is all rights to make war. In other words, all nations will need to cede their individual rights to make war on one another to this global organization that can use force in the collective good only in particular extreme circumstances that need to be laid out in advance and agreed to by all nations. In other words, this is a rule-oriented approach to the use of force only by the collective, in the interests of the collective, and using a collective tool, which is an international standing force that all nations also need to create that is made up of representatives uh, forces that represent all the nations of the world. This is another element of this uh, World Federation. Um, the World Parliament should also have the authority to manage all critical global resources, including energy resources, food and water that are absolutely critical to the well-being of humanity. Because in this interconnected world, it no longer makes sense for a nation to be able to hold others hostage just because of a geographical accident, because it happens to sit on uh, a bunch of energy resources or have access to a lot of fresh water um, or food. So this is uh, another area of, um, in, in which the, the global parliament uh, will have, uh, should, be, should have authority. One final area in which it should be given authority is a limited amount of uh, right uh, to ta tax the peoples of the world to a certain extent in order to create global funds for certain global purposes. For instance, again, a, a global fund to ensure that we are engaging in the, the research and de development that we need to find alternative renewable sources of energy. Um, a global fund to provide for bailouts when countries get into uh, financial straits and have sovereign debt that they can't deal with. This is a problem that Europe has been grappling with in the context of the EU and the, the Eurozone and the problems that Greece has had and Ireland has had and other countries have had. And they have been talking about, they haven't done it yet, but they are recognizing the, the, the need to have a, uh, a European fund into which they can tap and that would be based on taxation, uh, taxing all the peoples of Europe. So everybody feels like they have a stake in it, they're vested in it, and you're not just calling on a rich country to uh, continually bail out other countries that are struggling. Okay, so world parliament, we then we need a world executive that can actually ensure that the laws that are created are enforced because as we know in today's world, just having international laws is ins insufficient if we don't have an executive or in our case today, we, um, the, the Security Council is the closest we come to some kind of agency that is an executive task with the maintenance of, of peace and security in the world not doing so well in its mandate um, because it's hamstrung for a lot of reasons that we can go into, uh, chief among them being, being the veto power. 
But again, it's not truly representative of the nations of the world. Um, it is uh, the, the, the way it votes is not uh, really uh, democratic. Um, it is, uh, its mandate is very vague. Um, in the book I wrote in 2008, I recommended revising the mandate of the Security Council and the, one of the deputy attorney, um, uh, attorney generals, one of the deputy secretary generals of the United Nations uh, the, uh, was very keen on it and actually wrote a forward to the book. So we need to do this. We, we owe it to ourselves to clarify the mandates of all of these um, agencies that we choose to, to create. And, and the last one, apart from the international standing force that I, I referred to, is an international court of justice with binding and compulsory jurisdiction uh, that can step in and, and resolve disputes between nations before they get to a point where we have war and, and conflict of a level that rends asunder the fabric of our international community. So for instance, I'm thinking of the uh, problems going on in the East China Sea with all these uh, little rocks uh, that are being fought over by various nations, particularly China and a host of other nations, all claiming to have um, uh, the rights uh, to the waters around these rocks because they assert territorial control over them. And of course, they too are looking again at resources. They want the oil, the gas and other other resources that exist or they believe exist in those waters. Um, there are many examples of, of conflicts and growing conflicts right now over territory, largely because that territory is believed to sit on large amounts of, of energy resources. So we need an international court that can step in and adjudicate and pass a judgment that is then considered binding and that is enforceable. So again, this is where the international standing force would come in. Not only would it enforce the international laws passed by the World Parliament, but it would also enforce the, um, the judgments of the International Court of Justice in the event that a nation is recalcitrant and unwilling to, um, uh, to, to enforce that, that judgment, um, take it as binding on, on itself. All right, so that's the institutional in infrastructure. As I started off saying, in addition to the institutions infrastructure, we need to agree on a set of principles. Um, it's interesting, over the last 10 years, actually since I wrote the 2008 uh, book, there has been an increasing amount of literature on the need for identifying a set of what people now are referring to as shared global ethics. I, used, I refer to it in, in my writing as a set of foundational principles that we can all agree on. But it doesn't matter what, what, the, what one calls it. Um, the idea is an important one and it's delightful to see that more people are coming to the recognition that as an international community, we need to, to ascertain who we are, what our principles are, agree on them, and then apply them methodically to solving problems and very importantly, weave them into new global institutions that we create so that those institutions go, don't go the way of the institutions of yore with fragmentation and disunity and corruption and, 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 and falling apart. So what are some of these principles? Well, I think the most pivotal one is the recognition and awareness of our oneness, not only as peoples, but as nations. This is a critical, what I refer to, uh, it's a critical social reality that we ignore at our peril. You know, there are physical laws that govern our existence, like gravity. And um, if we want to build an airplane, we can choose to ignore the fact that gravity exists, but we ignore it at our peril. Uh, we won't be very successful in our endeavor and the plane will crash. The same is true of our um, social reality. Our social reality in this day and age is that uh, we really are one. Our oneness is apparent. We're all created or come into existence noble. We all are driven by the same hopes, the same fears, the same desires, the same challenges, the same weaknesses, and the same strengths. We really, when we look at each other, we're mirrors of each other's potential and capacity. And so 
when we once we recognize that oneness and weave it into our global institutions they will be successful and to give you a very small example think of the security council again if if we were to craft a new system of international relations and set up an agency tasked with the maintenance of, of peace and security if we started from the premise that we're all one we would never imagine giving any one or more nations the power of veto because it simply doesn't make sense to say we are all one i respect you as much as i respect myself but with all due respect, I think I know better in this instance, and even though 192 nations think we should do X in order to achieve peace, I believe that I know better, and therefore I'm going to veto what 192 other nations say. And it, it would just be, it would be a non-starter, and we wouldn't be wasting so much time. Thousands of articles have been written about the veto power of the Security Council and whether or not we should do um, away with it, and if so, how should it be an incremental approach? <laughs> should it be a, you know, should we do it immediately? And I, you know, all of these energies that are being misspent um, can be released to to deal with far more important things like tackling the challenges of today, like climate change. So oneness is key. A corollary of oneness is understanding that the advantage of the part. Can only, be can only be guaranteed by guaranteeing the advantage of the whole. This is a key principle that Jean Monnet recognized when he created the foundations of what we know today as the European Union. And um, it, it is the one principle in all three books that I've written, Collective Security Within Reach, Building a World Federation, and, and then my latest one, 2018, Bridge to Global Governance which I have hammered home. I think if we can get the world to recognize this principle and no other, we will have moved the ball forward significantly. Um, and it brings us back to that reality that I expressed at the beginning that we have become like a single organism. When you are a single body, the advantage, if you want a member or an organ of the body to be healthy, the only way to truly guarantee it is to guarantee a healthy body. So there are a whole bunch of other principles. They're all laid out in, in, in the book. I'm not going to go into them. And my final comment is that we stand at a critical crossroads in our human journey as a collective whole. We either unify or self-destruct. This is really, it is a very stark choice that we have to make. The path to self-destruction starts with a lot of suffering. Many parts of the world, people have already been suffering enormously in ways that you and I living here in the United States or in Western Europe cannot begin to imagine. The problem with this path, uh, if we don't unify and don't integrate, we move towards fragmentation. That's the alternative. And Fragmentation, which I discuss in a small chapter in Building a World Federation, is, is become the experience of our time. Um, people everywhere are scared. They see in their desire to take control over their own destinies. They believe uh, sincerely that the only way to do that is to break off from larger units and basically hunker down. Uh, neuroscientists and social scientists will tell you that this is what human beings tend to do when we get scared, when we get depressed, when we feel hopeless. We tend to hunker down, you know, the, the image of the individual, and it's usually a woman here sitting at home with her tub of ice cream, you know, drowning in her sorrows and not connecting with friends, or the guy with his beer doing the same. Uh, these are not uh, uh, very constructive ways of, of dealing with the problems. And again, psychologists and social scientists will tell you that what we ought to be doing is to reach out and connect with others and collaborate with them, share with them our challenges and come up with collective solutions. And this is what we need to be doing at an international level. So um, this business of fragmentation has, is deleterious for many reasons. It denies the reality that we're interconnected. It, um, 
it takes us back, it, it unravels a lot of the progress that we've made over decades towards uh, increasing integration and unity. It doesn't actually solve the problem because it denies the reality of our interconnectedness. Brexit is a prime example of that, this fragmentation, this desire to take back control over the destiny of a nation. It sounds glorious, but it completely discounts the fact that Britain is so interconnected with the rest of Europe that this step is, is leading to disastrous consequences and will lead to disastrous consequences that have now been um, talked about and written about a lot. The idea of people trying to hoard fresh vegetables and fruit and medicines is really a stunning one recognizing that if there is a, 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 a Brexit, especially a no-deal Brexit, there could be shortages and there, there will be shortages of all of those, that we won't, they won't have access to manufacturing parts for their manufacturing, that many of their doctors and nurses came from continental Europe and have now left and gone back to Europe. So the National Health Service is ailing even more than it was before. You know, all the various ways in which they thought they were going to take back control of their own destiny are proving to be chimeras. So, um, and, and we see this all over the world. And I, again, I talk about it in the book, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but, but you see these movements towards self-determination and fragmentation and breaking up into increasingly smaller units, um, manifesting themselves all around the world. Um, we need to be pushing in the opposite direction of integration. Um, we have good role models for doing this. The experience of the United States in moving from a confederation to a federation is a good one. The experience of the, the European Union, which has still not taken the final step of federating, but is suffering, I believe, as a result of that failure to take that final uh, step that Jean Monnet had always envisioned. That's another really good laboratory and experiment that we can be looking at to, to learn what we should do and what we can avoid. I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you for letting me share with you the big ideas. And um, I'll hand it over to whomever. I don't know if it's Gail Great. or Bob. Well, I'm not, I'm not seeing Gail, so I'm happy to just continue facilitating. Um, Hi, um, I, oh. I am, I, I'm on the call. I, I just phoned in since I couldn't get on by Zoom. Okay, so, do, you, do, you want to, do you want to take over or do you want me to continue? Well, you can continue as long as you've, you've started. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so let me, let me say thank you to it, Saveda. By the way, but, is, oh, is, it okay. be, is it being recorded? Um, I believe Tom is recording it. Is that correct, okay. Tom? Tom, are you there? <laughs> okay, so I don't have the answer to that, I believe, Tom. Oh, yes, it says it's recording. I see that okay. on the screen, yes. Okay. So, uh, so the answer is yes. So, um, so yeah, so Saveda, thank you for not only the overview of your book, but also the overview of your thinking. Uh, I wanted to mention to people, I think most of the folks on the call know that you're on the board of Citizens for Global Solutions, but in case everyone doesn't know that, I just wanted folks to know that as well. So following Gail's outline, um, the, you know, Gail sent out uh, six different questions or discussion topics. And I want to take the first one and basically kind of break it into two. It says general comments. So first, I just want to see if there are any questions that anybody on the line has for Soveda. Um, and let me ask, Soveda, are you um, able to stay with us throughout the duration, or do you need to leave the call before then? I'm able to stay. I'm, I'm very interested to hear. I, uh, let me be clear. I do not wish to uh, stifle your discussion, free discussion. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so tell me if you think that my staying on might do that. I'm very curious because I learn a lot from hearing what people are saying. I will not intervene. I'm happy to be a silent observer and listen and learn because I, I learn as much uh, from you. Um, Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, so yeah, so fir first question is, are there any questions for Soveda? Uh, if you're on mute, you'll have to take yourself off mute to ask a question. Uh, but let me, uh, and I'll take a cue. So um, give me your name if you have a question for Soveda, and then we'll just go, go in order. Anybody Ron have a question? Gla okay, Ron, Ron Glossop in uh, St. Louis, Ron. Missouri has a question. Okay, thank you, Ron. Hold on a moment, Ron. Anybody else want to get in the queue for a question? Going once, going twice. Okay, I put myself in too. 
Okay, Ron, take it away. <clears throat> Savita, I just wanted to ask you a question about language. It seems to me that the Baha'is have a wonderful idea about the need for world government. They have another important idea, the idea for a common language. And I believe very strongly that we're headed toward a world where there will be a common language. It will be English or Chinese or Spanish. But it does seem to me that, as my own personal view, Esperanto is the right language for the global community because it's no nation's language. Could you say a word or two about what your reactions are to the Esperanto movement? So um, the, the principle of uh, needing an international auxiliary language that would be taught in all the schools of the world in addition to our own language in, in order to maintain the unity and diversity, which I think is a critical element of, of both Baha'i thinking and, and my own thinking, um, is, um, is, is an important one. Now, the question of which language is really a question for the leaders to, to decide on. I think there was a time um, in the early part of the 20th century when the Esperanto movement had gained a lot of traction and there was a lot of interest. And at that time, I think that if there had been a more of a buy-in, let's put it that way, into Esperanto, it might have worked. Um, today, I don't know I, 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 my, my senses, and I'm not an expert on this. You probably know more yourself, Ron, since you're very interested in this. Um, I, I don't, I no longer hear, definitely amongst the younger generation, um, most of them don't even know what Esperanto is, let alone be interested in that movement. I think the idea is an important one, the principle that we need this in order to engender understanding and to reduce the chances of misunderstanding and miscommunication between nations. So, um, and as to what language it should be, again, this is really for the nations of the world to decide. As a practical matter, if you talk to, I talk to my scientist friends, English already is in their view, at least in the area of science, the, the international language that everybody uses. Um, um, and, and you know what, I could also imagine that we may go through two stages at different stages of our collective growth. We may start off with a language like English, but as we continue to evolve and grow, we may decide that another language um, is better capable of expressing thoughts, feelings, ideas, nuances, concepts. Who knows? The, the bottom line is, I don't know. I have no strong feelings one way or the other. I think if we can get people to agree on a language, no matter what it is, that's an international auxiliary language, that's wonderful. I don't have a, a dog in the fight, so to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Okay. I'm next in the queue, but then I'll see if anyone else has any questions. So my, my question is, you know, your, your, your first principle uh, that we have an unprecedented level of interconnectedness, you know, is, is the reality now. Certainly, I think everyone on this call would agree, and much of the world would agree. Um, but there, you know, and, and the way um, it seems like the way you're talking about it is kind of an appeal to reason. You know, the scientists say this, the neurologists say this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of, you know, get with the program. Um, but as, as you've also said, there are people who um, aren't following that reason, that line of logic, and there's a growing trends of isolationism and nationalism and all that stuff. So I, I, I know you must have thought about, or I'm assuming you must have thought about, how do you appeal to those people? Um, you know, how do we reach out? Um, yeah, to the, I'll, just call, I'll leave it at those people. And just wondering if you can share your thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you, Bob. It's a really good question. Look, I think we have done, and I, I take responsibility myself, this is why I do the work I do. I think we've done a very poor job of A, reaching out and engaging with people who uh, come from a different position. And we've done a poor job of, of um, demonstrating through 
through lucid proofs and arguments and appeals, not just to science, but to reality, that we are interconnected. And in the book, what I've tried to do is give a number of examples that completely demonstrate this. Um, so, you know, I, I give the example of the Fukushima disaster, where, you know, we thought, oh, they have a meltdown, it's all the way in Japan, that's their problem, what's it got to do with us? Well, meanwhile, a couple of years later, people swimming on the west coast of the United States don't recognize that the waters that they're swimming in contain cesium from the, uh, from, from the, the, the um, radioactive materials that have been pumped into the Pacific Ocean over in Japan. The Ebola crisis is another perfect example of our reckon. It's like every now and then we wake up and we realize, oh boy, you know, Ebola always existed in Africa. It's come and gone. A few hundred people would die and the whole thing would die down and we'd have maybe a two-line article buried in a newspaper somewhere. All of a sudden in 2014 with the Ebola crisis in West Africa, it became an international global problem and was put on the agenda of the Security Council as an item of prime security concern. Why? Because, gosh, these people are no longer staying in their villages. They're leaving and coming into the cities. They're, they're interacting with others who get on airplanes and fly to the United States and Europe and China. And all of a sudden, the reality of our interconnectedness this is not sort of this, this this is not a philosophy. This is the reality of the world we live in becomes apparent because Ebola is now as much our problem as it is the problem of the West Africans. And a good thing it was too, because then we all got engaged and brought the best minds and science and so on, the engagement by the international community, and we nipped it in the bud. We finally got rid of it in, 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 for that for the period of that crisis. There are lots of very concrete examples of our interconnectedness. Right now, there are two things happening in the world economic. Uh, Brexit and trade wars are we're being told by top economists, leading economists, including Christine Lagarde, that these two factors are going to, are likely to cause a global recession. They are the driving factors towards a global recession. Okay, we can sit here in the United States for all we like and say, we're first, we're disconnected, we don't need the rest of the world. But the reality is that our economies and our financial systems are so interconnected that if one place goes down, we're all going down with it. So it's not a, so I think we need to do a better job of taking these realities and sharing them with people and engaging with them, not in a spirit of, oh, we know better, you idiots, you know, what are you thinking, which, which is really the way of our times, but rather, uh, what keeps you up away uh, at night? What is it you're concerned about? Here's what I'm concerned about. Surely if we collaborate together, we can come up with solutions that address our common concerns so great good thank you thank you so let me see if there are any questions that emerged in the last minute or two before we move to comments okay so let, let's shift gears to more of the kind of the book club format um, so kind of speaking among ourselves with Soveda listening in <laughs> are there any and following uh, Gail's uh, outline are there any comments either about the book, about the, um, the fundamental principles, the thinking that uh, Saveda has uh, brought to us? So floors open. I'll take a cue again if there's uh, any folks who have any comments. <coughs> Ron Sorry. Gossip has a comment. Okay. Right. And I see a hand went up. Is that Father Ben? That's Father Ben. Okay, um, so let me get you in line. You, I'll put you first since you haven't spoken yet, then Ron. Anybody else who has a comment? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'll put myself in. Oh, Evan, I saw your hand. Okay, we'll put Evan in. Anyone else, especially anyone who hasn't spoken? Okay, great. Uh, and if you're on the phone only, you have to speak up. I don't see you raising your hand. So, okay, then I'll put myself in after Evan. So it's four people. Father Ben, why don't you start? The difficulty. Seeing you, you, Father Ben, you have to get closer to the microphone uh, for us to hear you. Thank the you. Difficulty seeing 
uh, overwhelming. And I think it's important that we don't give up. Who will uh, continue if not us? Great, thank you. Okay, Ron. Bob, I can hear you fine. I cannot hear others. I just want to make a comment. I really congratulate Surveda on this book. I think she has done an absolutely tremendous job of laying out the outline of what is happening, what has happened, and what needs to happen in the future. It is just a fantastic work that she has done in this book, and I do think we need to figure out how to get more people to read it. Thank you. Thank you. So before we get to Evan, I just want to um, take off from Ron's quick comment that it's hard to hear people. That I, 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 Almost every phone call, I urge people to get headsets, that, the, that, that having a microphone right by your mouth and speaking even through the phone, because that connection is better if you call in for the audio, um, that is really the way to go in these conference calls. It's very difficult doing it through the computer's own microphone and speaker, or it's harder to hear well. So, okay, having said that, Evan, you're on, you got the floor. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, I throughout uh, this uh, conversation, the, the thing that's, that strikes me is the uh, dominance of short-termism of thinking over uh, longer-term uh, uh, ways of thinking. The, the uh, human te tendency to take it and run rather than investing in any way in the future. And um, that, to me, is the, is, is the critical challenge that we face. How do you give people the faith, and I think it is a matter of faith in a lot of ways, to um, invest, to uh, sacrifice some short-term benefit uh, or comfort or even uh, security and uh, trust uh, 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 that um, tying one's future to other people across the world or um, that you don't know uh, will produce uh, good results simply because um, of the uh, goodwill of the people involved. Okay, thank you, Evan. I'll call on myself and see if there are any other comments. Um, I want to go back to Soveda's um, analogy or metaphor of humanity being at a, at a stage of adolescence right now. Um, it reminded me of something as a psychologist that I want to share, um, that in family therapy theory, um, there's the idea that a family, just like the individuals go through a life cycle and there are stages, that families go through a life cycle of you know individuals, and then they couple, then they have a ch single child, more kids, empty nest. You know, there's a series of, of 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 phases, and that you know, quote unquote, pathology emerges when a family gets stuck at a particular phase and doesn't move to the next one, like the child who grows up and never moves out, or the person you know later in life when one spouse d dies and the other one doesn't get past that and just grieves for the rest of their life. That, that in, in, in the family's developmental lifestyle, the theory is psychopathology emerges when, at these stuck points. And it, it just struck me how parallel that, that notion in family therapy is to what Saveda was saying, that, that humanity itself is stuck uh, at a period of adolescence, and that's why we're seeing all these problems. So... Um, so just sharing that. So any other comments before we move on? Okay. And I want to allow... Ron, Ron would like to say something again. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Ron. 
I don't want to dominate the conversation too much, but I do want to point out, I think that a critical issue is the identity issue. People need to identify themselves as members of the human community. And what is it that keeps them from doing it? I think that there are many factors, race factors, uh, economic factors, but a major factor is language. If people cannot communicate with each other, then they can't overcome the other obstacles. That's why I think Esperanto is so critical. I'm very concerned that we're moving toward a world where language, where English will become the dominant language in the world. That won't be a bad thing for, for me, but it will for many other people. And I think it will be a disaster if we don't recognize right now. And the League of Nations, that was the first resolution at the Assembly of the League of Nations that all the children of the world should be taught Esperanto. And it was killed by the French on grounds that we didn't need an international language like Esperanto because French was already the international language. It's time now for the English-speaking people not to make the same mistake again. Okay. Th thank you, Ron. And let me point out for those who don't know that, that Ron has been a uh, leading participant and leader within the Esperanto movement. He has written on it. He's gone to conferences. He has spoken to me in Esperanto till my head spun. So just to let you know that, that, that Ron has been very involved. He's not just you know, spouting. Yeah, and I'm, again, I'm giving a sermon on it tomorrow yeah. morning, there which is go. one reason why I'm so hot prepped about this. <laughs> That's great. So Ron is practicing his sermon on us, uh, just to let you know. Okay. So before we move to um, the other questions that Gail prepared, let me just, uh, since we're fortunate enough to have Serveda with us, let me just open the floor uh, Saveda, and if you want to make any comments on all the comments that were made or respond to anything that came up, you don't have to, but if you want to, I wanted to give you the, you know, open the floor to you as well. I, I just wanted to make one comment apropos of what Evan said. Evan, you're absolutely right, and I think it's right at the beginning of the book. I have a section on uh, bad habits that we need to break. And the top of the list is expediency. Expediency is my word for short-termism. The um, making decisions based on short-term calculations and in narrow self-interest. Um, because, and, and we can convince people not to do that by again, going back and demonstrating to them how doing this time and time again with very concrete examples has, has led us to a place where we're not happy being. And so why continue this habit that has proven patently um, uh, deleterious to our own interests? So I, I just wanted to have, thank you, thank you for raising that. But it, it's, a, it's a critical part of our journey of growth here. Great. Thank you, Savita. <clears throat> so I'm going to move to the questions that Gail has prepared. For those of you who are just on the phone um, or who don't have your computers there to see them, uh, I will read it out loud. Um, so the first question is, the European coal and steel community was given as an example of countries giving up some sovereignty because each perceived that it was in their interest and as a precursor to the EU. What opportunities are there at present for other countries to create similar communities in which decisions could be enforced? Again, the question part is, what opportunities are there at present for other countries to create similar communities in which decisions would be enforced? So, floor is open, and we'll go with that as long as we do, and then move on to the next one. Yeah, Evan? Well, I think the first example that I'm thinking of is the Law of the Sea Treaty uh, that has been uh, um, acceded to by many, many countries and, and in the United States has been agreed to by many sectors, including the military, uh, and yet is dead in the water in our Senate. So that is number one in my mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other? Uh, Tad Daly has someone? a comment about that. Oh, Tad, uh, j jump in. Thank you, Bob, uh, and hello, colleagues and comrades. And uh, Saveda, I also just 
uh, like so many, really want to applaud uh, your great contribution in both this book and uh, some of your other works about really lay, lay, laying out the road uh, and, and b both laying out the road and laying out the, the destination at the end of the road. I jumped in. I, I do have a couple of other comments I'll work in at some point, but um, I, I wanted to jump on what, what Evan just said right now, because it is that law of the sea treaty and the fact that it, it's 30 or 40 years ago now, and it still hasn't, if I understand it right, hasn't been ratified by the U.S. Senate and hasn't come into force legally around the world, is such a great example of why we need a world legislature. When, all one, when the only tool one has at one's disposal is treaties among sovereign states where it's dependent on each individual state to sign on, that's a very limited tool, and it doesn't really provide a mechanism, the same kind of mechanism of governance as Soveda very articulately um, shared with us as a legislature. The difference between a, one of the main differences, the main difference between treaties and law is that treaties have to be signed on to by each individual participant. And if, if an individual participant, in this case a member state, chooses not to join, that's the end of the discussion. A legislature that makes laws applies to all the members of the community, not just the people who voted for it. And so that, to me, that law of the sea is, is governing three quarters of the planet, after all, is one of the quintessential examples of why law. And Ron has like another carrier. comment. Okay, okay let's, let's, let's let Ted finish, and then we'll see if there are any others to jump in. I'm sorry, Ted, continue. Yeah, that was it. What, 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 that was my final sentence, why law at the world level is so superior to treaty making at the world level. Thank you. Great. Good. Thank you. Uh, Ron, good. Take, take it away. Yeah, I want to make this last comment, then I'm going to have to go away because I have to eat lunch. On the other hand, I do hope I can get to get information on how to get the recording that's being made. I do want to say that, and in fact, I much agree with you that the legislature is important, but Saveda her, herself also makes a point about the importance of courts and police to enforce the decisions that are made by the legislature. And then I would also add that if we want to move from where we are now until to the idea of uniting the whole world in a federation, one thing is go step by step. I'm not sure it would be the only way or even the best way, but one way would be region by region. Europe has moved much ahead. Africa, South America is moving in the right direction. I think we need to pay attention to what's going on in these other regions like the African Union and the Union of Latin American countries. Great. Thank you, Ron. Any other responses to that question? I guess one other oh. thing is the International Criminal Court. <laughs> yes. Great. Anything else? Uh, Bob, if okay, I I'll may. I, yes. I, I, um, so, Ron, that's a, that's a very good point. There are many ways to, to skin this cat, and um, doing it region by region is, is something that I proposed uh, in the 2008 book, Collective Security Within Reach. There is an, yet another uh, alternative method, and there's no reason why we shouldn't proceed in tandem, actually. So in, in, in 2018, when I wrote Bridge to Global Governance, I realized that the world may not be ready to take the leap um, to a world federation. Maybe too big an idea for them to swallow. So why not come up with a supranational institution that can tackle a couple of global challenges successfully, demonstrating thereby to the world that A, it's doable, that it's efficacious, building trust in the uh, how such institutions can operate without taking over the world, which seems to be the biggest fear of all people whenever you raise the question of world government, whether it's limited or a world federation. Um, and, and, I, and I literally proposed a supranational organization to which all nations would cede all rights to create nuclear energy and how this would help resolve climate change issue, nuclear proliferation, and um, energy distribution. 
So that's another model. And there's no reason why we can't proceed on, on both fronts at the same time. I think we just need to be creative. And, and right now, time is, is running short. We should be trying everything we possibly can, not being shy about it. Thank you. OK, uh, I'll put myself in the queue, and then we'll go on to the next question. Um, two quick things. One is uh, it, not, not a particular opportunity, but just a comment on, on the, everything we've been talking about here, that Saveda listed a whole slew of opportunities, climate change, the financial crisis, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and, many, and several of us mentioned other opportunities. I just want to point out one thing that seems common among most of them is most of the nations do agree. There's just a couple of holdouts, and they're often the us, you know, the U.S., and some of the you know, larger, more powerful countries. So I think that's, um, you know, Bill, Bill, I think Bill Pace's insight uh, in creating the ICC was if you get enough of the small and mid, mid-level, mid-sized countries together, um, you can proceed with something and perhaps even, quote, unquote, shame the larger countries into going along eventually. But I just wanted to point out, um, you know, the fact that it, it seems that there is a lot of international agreement on many of those things. It's just the holdouts that seem to be the problem. So that's point one. Point two is something that uh, I just want to re re repeat something that I heard Andreas Bummel say in 2012, which very much aligns with what Saveda said a moment ago, um, at a um, World Federalist Movement Congress in Winnipeg in 2012, I was trying to assemble a panel of, um, of people who are advocating for different paths to World Federation. And Andreas made what I was the only comment that I remember from that whole panel that he said, I think it's going to be very much like, um, you know, like a, a basketball game when one group is dribbling down the court, they pass it to the next group, they dribble more, they pass it, and that's how we advance. It's not going to be any one thing. We're going to see more synergy. Um, people are going to advance at different levels, at different things. Ideas will merge, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the only comment that I remember from, from that whole panel, uh, that it really is an all-hands-on-deck um, if you look at the civil rights movement, it wasn't just Martin Luther King. It wasn't just the Black Panthers. It wasn't just the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You know, it took all of those working sometimes in very different ways, sometimes even with the appearance of opposing each other, to get the civil rights movement to move forward. So, um, so I like that metaphor, and I wanted to pass it on. Thank you. Okay, anything else on that question before we move to the next one? Okay, yes, again, uh, oh, yes, who's Tom speaking? Tom H. Okay, Tom, take it away. Uh, maybe climate change could be one of the problems that we could get the, uh, uh, to, to work on, like Savita suggests, mm -hmm. and, and, and use the Paris Agreement as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Anything else before we move on to the next one? Okay, I'll read the uh, question three. Um, and let me point out, we have just under a half hour to go, just to let people know. Okay. The financial crisis was given as an example of a global problem that could have, could have been dealt with better through a world federation. The U.S. had regulations on banks that seemed to work for a while, but were undermined through corruption. If a world federation is created that has the power of enforcement, it is important that the rules it enforces are fair and that they are enforceable appropriately. Now the question, how could a World Federation be protected against corruption so that regulations would be fair and implemented as intended? Again, how could a World Federation be protected against corruption so that regulations would be fair and implemented as intended? I'll take a cue if people want to jump in. Okay. I see Lee first. And then Evan, was your hand up? Yes. Okay. Then Evan? And Dave and, Orton. And Dave Orton. Okay. And then I'll check for another cue after that. So, Lee, take it away. Lee, you need to go off mute. We don't hear you. You're on mute. 
Okay. Uh, the first thought that came to my mind when I read that question was that in our country, we limit corruption, I think, by having terms. Each office has a term. And so we would need to have term limits on the federation level too. Great, term limits, thank you. Okay, Evan. Yeah, you know, when you talk about corruption, what I think about is the, the mathematical or maybe uh, uh, economics idea of sub-optimization. In other words, what's best for any subunit of an entity may not be best for what is for the entity as a whole. So I, I think that corruption will be a, an ongoing problem in any system and that it's really the moral fortitude of people that will overcome it. Thank you, Evan. Dave Orton. Um, I think that uh, what's necessary is an agreed upon world constitution that would include things like Shirley mentioned with term limits and, uh, and separation of powers, et cetera. Uh, and it's through that then that you would hold individuals accountable for when they violate the constitution. Um, that's where they could be prosecuted. So I think so much depends upon uh, coming up, um, agreeing upon a written constitution for the world. Great, thanks. Anybody else wanna jump in on fighting corruption at the global level? Okay, I'll throw myself in the queue. Anybody else? I'll, I'll um, make a comment at the end. Oh, sure. No, I'm always going to turn to you once all the comments are made. Yeah. Okay, so then I'll get Saveda in. So, okay, so, um, so for myself, the, the, I think the first thing would need to be an unprecedented level of transparency, that, the, um, that something needs to be built in structurally into every system at the world level so that the results are out there whether it's you know, you know, videotaping, live streaming of meetings, whether it's an unprecedented, unprecedented level of access of the media, uh, but there needs to be, in order to have world trust, you need to have the, the light of day <laughs> in, in all of these proceedings. So that'd be the first thing. The, the second thing, and other people mention it, is the good old checks and balances. Um, that there, but there needs to be new structures created, like one of the proposals I heard is that there's not one prime minister, you know, if there's a world parliament, but there are five, one for every continent, and they rotate. So there's no concentration of power for a prolonged period of time, and v various things of, of that sort. Um, oh, I said five continents, seven continents, whatever. And... Um, and lastly, again, that the good old principle that we're familiar with of subsidiarity. If all of the decisions aren't made at one level, but they're made at different levels as close to people as you can, that's another structural way uh, to combat uh, corruption. So that's me and Soveda. So I, it, it's interesting because baked into the question was an assumption that I think we've all been proceeding with. And that is that what has led to the economic crises, uh, especially the world economic crisis, 2008 and so on, and in, in the West, starting in the West, um, was corruption. So my understanding is it wasn't corruption that got us there. Not that corruption doesn't exist, I'm, I'm, but it was other things. Um, and the experts, it's interesting, they start with kind of softer questions. So transparency is key. But one of them is when you start to see things unraveling as we started to see in this country, stop the denial and learn from the mistakes. That's one of the headings under the financial sector in my book. It's fascinating that that is a big part of what happened. People started to see, but I don't know what was there pride or they had a vested interest. I remember Alan Greenspan, this one of his last comments as he left. Um, they said to him, well, you know, you were so confident, you assured us that your way worked. And he said, yep, it was a mistake to deregulate, to loosen regulations. I'm sorry. 
now I know better. And I thought, wow, all this disaster and all you get to say at the end is, I'm sorry. You know, there's so much hubris involved because people were saying, you know, there was, there was a disagreement over philosophy. Should there be more tightened regulations? Should we start deregulating? And we had started deregulating in this country. There wasn't enough monitoring and oversight. We could see things were moving south and we're not willing to learn from them. Um, so those are some of the bigger lessons that I think by virtue of having uh, a, a, a world government, a global federation in which you have more um, diversity of thinking, people are going to be able to come together. You're going to, yes, you have to structure transparency into the very system. Again, as Jean Monnet did, it's doable because we just have to look at the model of the European coalition and get ideas from it. Um, but other than that, we need to learn some of the deeper lessons uh, about sitting up and paying attention when things start to go wrong as opposed to sticking our heads in the sand. It, it seems to have been a big one with this global financial crisis. So, Great. Anyway. Thank you, Saveda. And I see Tom waving. Take it away, Tom. Hi. Can Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, uh, so so I think what we can do You're is going, look though. at the United States and really study what's happened in the last few decades. Uh, we don't usually call it corruption, but it's it's where power. Uh, gets uh, uh, too strong, and and so Lee's suggestion of term limits is one way to uh, <clears throat> reduce that power. Uh, another way is not to equate uh, money with free speech, like the Supreme Court has done. So in other words, we should look at the United States uh, and learn from what's what's happening to our country and apply those uh, principles in world Feder making a better world federation. Right. Thank you, Tom. Gail Anyone? has a comment. Yeah. Go ahead, Gail. Um, I think it's a, a dilemma in when I think about this is that when you have a centralized agency, be it a world government in the case of the world or a national government in the case of a nation, those who are after power and money know where to focus, namely on that. And um, they will find ways to undermine it. And well, as far as regulations, I think there was corruption in the, re the insofar as there are regulatory agencies, you know, the bad guys know where to go by, by corrupting the regulators. And term limits won't solve it because what you do is you have a revolving door. So if, you know, if, if, the, um, it, if the legislator does what the, um, the corporation wants, then they'll give it a big fat job when they leave. So it's, it's a complicated, I think very difficult to prevent corruption, especially over time. And I think the only way, really, to um, maybe uh, mitigate that is through also having a very strong grassroots activism and, and vigilance. So that's a dilemma, as I see it, is on the one hand, we need centralized agencies to do certain things. And yet, um, if, if we rely on those too much, um, I don't think they'll work. Thank you, Gail. And Father Ben, I saw you waving your hand as well. Uh, yes, uh, I'm coming from a religious uh, perspective, and I don't think we want to neglect uh, faith and spirituality. And uh, St. Ignatius has something uh, he called spiritual freedom. That is basically, in a secular terms, uh, openness, that we need to be open to others and open to other ideas. Uh, 
So I, I just want to say a word in favor of uh, faith and uh, openness. Great, thank you. Okay, with that, I'll move to the next question. Let me point out we're beginning to come down the home stretch. I want to pause a few minutes before, uh, you know, for, before the end of time to hand it over to Gail to say anything she wants to say about both wrapping up and the next session. Um, so going right to the next question, uh, number four, if you have the list in front of you, uh, the need for a World Federation to enforce a responsibility to protect uh, to prevent humanitarian crises is another example discussed in the book. However, if a World Federation has the power to intervene in a country, the World Federation has an R2, um, what, responsibility, oh, yeah, responsibility, oh, responsibility to get it right, <laughs> I see. Uh, how would a World Federation avoid powerful countries abusing their power to target the less powerful with false charges as an, as an accusation for wars of aggression? Let me read that question again. How would a World Federation avoid powerful countries abusing their power to target the less powerful with false charges as an excuse for wars of aggression? Okay. Floor is open. I'll take a cue if anyone wants to jump in. Uh, Tad, Tad certainly has a comment about that. Okay, got Tad. I also see Evan. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Okay, take it away, Tad. Well, first let me say that this was a small, uh, I don't know if quibble is quite the right word, but a, uh, a choice of language that I would use a little bit differently than you, Saveda, um, when you uh, uh, made your opening presentation, because you talked about... Um, armies and soldiers and and i think uh at the world level and I, I i think you said if i can paraphrase only the world government can wage war and i certainly understand what you're talking about there but i really think it's important to use the right kind of terminology and for me armies exist their raison d'etre their definition to defend themselves against, or to defend their countries more precisely, against other armies. And I think it's much better for us to describe uh, the use of force uh, at the world level as police rather than armies, and engaging in world law enforcement rather than engaging in uh, war. Um, and that's why I jumped in on this particular question that was just posed, because... Um, you know, the, the question was, in a world federation, would, wouldn't powerful countries sort of manipulate the process to exploit weak, weak countries? Um, they certainly might in a non-military way, but one of the bedrock principles of a real world government, world federation, world state existing under a world constitution is that the countries don't have armies, just like, as we've said to each other a thousand times, Illinois and Wisconsin don't have armies to protect themselves against each other. So that's the main, um, it, it's one of the huge benefits of uh, the evolution of the human race towards a world federation and would be the chief safeguard against the uh, concern expressed in this question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Evan? Yeah, well, what, what is occurring to me about this, in other words, um, uh, protecting people in a less powerful position from the depredations of the powerful, among other things, um, is that it is to think about the principles of restorative justice and uh, establishing a, a, a peer group, a peer council of the less uh, uh, powerful countries to um, support uh, their neighbor or their uh, similarly situated uh, country um, that but I do think that the the, the ideas of restorative justice uh, definitely do apply in this uh, and, and as well as other peacemaking or peace building uh, um, activities of the of the UN among others 
Okay. Thank you, I sir. I'm Melanie. Um, so take it away. Yay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just would like to comment on what Tad just said. Um, so, yes, yeah, so if we take away the military and if we kind of correlate it towards what we experienced with the United States, there's no army, let's say, that, uh, you know, uh, individual states don't have armies to um, protect themselves from each other kind of thing. So when we have a world federation or world government, who's going to say what countries are more powerful? What makes another country more powerful than another? Be right now, it's the, the fist, it's the, the army, it's the what I have, what you don't have. Or it's just the imagination or myth that the United States is more, um, is greater or better, or, you know, this whole, it's, it's also social myths that we have. You know, why would people still want to come to the United States right now, you might ask, because there's still a myth going on that it's a great, great place to be. So um, I just think it's interesting that, you know, maybe we can take our minds out of this idea that there will be a more powerful country. It's gonna be, we're all in this together and it's gonna be the power of the people. It's the power of the individual and the individuals actually taking action in what interests them that will, in, and, and hopefully education that will get us to think that way where, okay, um, what interests me, but also thinking, is this better for the entire world all the time? Any decision you make, is this better for the collective? Is this better for everybody? So the power of the people, I think we don't need to, we, we shouldn't neglect because really that is, that is uh, the most power. And we, we, we think we don't have it and we lose it because of that. So that's just my comment. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'll, I'll throw myself in. Um, you know, I think all of these problems that we're talking about, there, there's no way to guarantee 100% that we could prevent them. You know, I, I think, I mean, give, given we're dealing with human beings and human nature, there's always a possibility of, of things going, you know, off the rails. However, I do think it's important to do everything we can to try to lessen the probability that, that, that these bad things are going to happen. In, th in this case, I think the, the problem, the tricky part, I think, will be the transition that, to a World Federation. If you look at the United States right now, we're, you, you, you might say we're a more mature democracy. That's arguable, but let me just use the, premise that for a moment. So now in the mature democracy phase, we're not going to have Illinois attacking another state, or we're not going to have them trying to jockey for power or whatever. But in the early days, in the founding of the United States, those things did happen. The larger, more populated states were trying to get more voice than the other ones. States did attack others. And, you know, there, there were problems at that time. I think the, I, I think the analogy holds that if the, a World Federation does happen and not every country goes into it or immediately, we will probably need a standing army for a while during the transition against whoever is not part of the Federation. You know, hopefully it'll never have to be used, but there will be an, a, a, a militarized period before we can move into a police force when, when all the nations are, are there. You know, I, so I, I think we, 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 need to be, we would need to be extra vigilant during the transition because I think, you know, in, in those moments of chaos and uncertainty, the opportunists who are not thinking globally and we're all in this together are going to look to have how they can have privileged positions. Um, and we just need to do our best to prevent that from happening. So we do move into a period. I think it was uh, Stephen Hawkins, right? He's the physicist. He said that all we have to do, humanity, all that humanity has to do is get through the next 200 years. You know, if we can get through the next 200 years, it'll be smooth sailing, you know. So I don't know what he based that comment on, but I, I think it speaks to this issue of transitioning, um, that that's going to be the, 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 the tricky part. And then hopefully it could be smooth sailing. 
I see Lee, and then we'll, we may need to wrap it up. Go ahead, Lee. Well, I was going to point out that the if we had a world federation, then the less powerful country could take the case to the, the court to the, mm. and have it resolved at the court level. Yep. May I? Um, so yes, I was going to turn to you to wrap it up. <laughs> so go ahead. Okay. So very quick, you know, we've never experienced a true world federation and it's fascinating. Our mindset is still so um, caught up in what we've had, including right now, say the United Nations, which is not nowhere near world federation. It has none of the authorities we've talked about, no binding legislation, no ability to enforce, um, no, no standing, whatever you want to call it, police force, army, none of the above, um, and no international court with compulsory and binding jurisdiction that's enforceable. So we have all these fears, but when we think about what we're talking about, we're talking about a, a government that is elected by the peoples of the world. So the peoples of the world, we need to we clearly need to continue educating so that we all recognize the importance of electing leaders who have the interests of the collective whole in mind. And surely, as Jean Monnet himself said with the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community, that can be in every country, we can surely find a handful of people who take the interests of the collective into account. So those are the people that, that we will be electing. Secondly, the whole structure won't be like it is now. There will not be a power veto. There will not be unanimous voting. There will be majority voting after a full consultation in which you have all these diverse viewpoints. This concept of powerful and weak won't be represented in the World Federation in the way we fear. Um, so for instance, funding is one of the key reasons we now have uh, countries in international intergovernmental organizations who are willing to vote because they're funding the organization. The U.S. says, you know, we've been paying more money to fund the U.N. so we get a bigger say. In a world federation, the funding will be completely, at least the model that I propose, Compl uh, uh, the, the question of funding will completely be taken out of it. Funding will come from other sources that have nothing to do with voluntary contributions of nation states and therefore give them a bigger say. So a lot of our fears, I think, are due, we're just importing them wholesale from the way things are and have been uh, without trusting that we can create a structure in which a lot of these key uh, potential challenges can be eliminated. The last thing I want to say, apropos of terminology, I, I hear you, Tad, and David Otten and I have had this conversation over several years now. Um, so imagine a situation where we have a world federation, where each country has given up all arms except the amount they need to maintain order within their borders. So, you know, a, a United States of the world, so to speak. And then you have um, let's say five years down the line, a nation of the world, there is a genocidal leader that arises um, who tries to create a secret nuclear weapons program that threatens the peace of the world. In my mind, at that point, there's nothing, I mean, I don't balk at the idea of the world community sending in a world army to bring that nation or that dictator or that genocidal leader to heal. I don't feel the need to craft it as a police force just to make everybody feel comfortable with the verbiage. To me, it demonstrates strength and flexibility to say this is an army representing the peoples of the world that is going to go in and ensure that no one nation can breach the peace of the world and unilaterally basically destabilize us as an international community. But, you know, it ultimately doesn't matter. I mean, again, I'm not vested in the terminology. It's the principle of the thing. What is this force? How is it made up? Um, who gets to make the decisions on when it's used and how it's used, in what circumstances? And those are all, those all need to be rule-based decisions. In other words, decisions that all the nations of the world agree on in advance and that constitute, they often would say this would be part of the 
or constitution, however you want to term it, there has to be a set of rules. So it's not based on fuzzy policies that are made up in the moment on the basis of short termism and expediency, but rather rules that are based for our long term interests and in which we have all um, uh, to which we have all agreed. So that's that's it for now for me. Great. Th thank you so much. I, I want to begin to wrap us up by first thanking you, Saveda, uh, for your time today. Uh, thanking you for your work, uh, your books and other work you've done for the cause. And also thank you for serving on the board. Um, so yeah, so thank a global thank you for all of that. I want to take the last minute or two and turn this back over to Gail uh, to say anything she wants to say to not only wrap up the day, but talk about future sessions. So Gail, take it away. Well, um, we, we have a flexible schedule in that, um, you know, depending on what book we're discussing or work we're discussing, you know, we might spend one session or we might c continue it on for the next session. So um, one question is, do we feel that we have finished our discussion of this book or do we want to continue it? And um, also to think of what could be next in line for us to discuss. And then if we have another session on this book, you know, probably we would want it another, another session next month. But if it's a new book, we would have two months so that we'd have time to, to read in between. So, so would, would, you, would you send that, an, since, since we've reached the, the end right now, would you send out an email uh, to that effect? Sure. And, and then we can could, we could look at the compiled uh, will of the people, if you will, and then uh, make the appropriate move. Okay. Great. Okay, there, anything there else you want to say? There, I, should, yeah. I should say there are two questions that we did not address, um, numbers five and six. Yes. So I don't know what interest there is in, you know, continuing discussion and right. addressing those questions. Yes, and you could ask that else. in the email. You, you can okay. point that out and say, do folks want to reconvene around those questions and anything else that may come of that? Yeah. Okay. Great. So do you want to say the two magic words, meeting adjourned, or, um, or something else first? Okay. Well, meeting adjourned. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank Bye. you so much. Thanks so much, Saveda, for your great Bye. contributions and inspiration. Yes, thank you so much. This is brilliant. I appreciate you too, Bob, and Gail for setting this up. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Bye. Bye-bye.